that I've seen happen in people's lives is that they can lock on to a particular verse of Scripture, and that particular verse of Scripture, they can continue to um, meditate on it and continue to um, enforce it, so to speak, or, or declare it in a certain way. And they will walk in victories like nothing you've ever seen before because they get a revelation on one scripture. Everybody say one scripture. And I'm telling you right now, one thing can make a difference in your life. You know, one of, one of the verses of scripture that I've been standing on, we're going to study tonight a little bit, um, you know, since I've been here. And I still declare it over myself. I have it, I have it um, you know, written down. I ha you know, every time I talk to people, I mean, I bring it up. And I don't want us to turn there, but, you know, we ended up last week on Isaiah 59, 19, and it says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So we know that there's a standard that can be raised uh, in front of us that can literally stop the forces of evil. And this is why, you know, can I make a declaration here tonight, y'all? This is why I don't live in fear of a coronavirus. Do you understand? I, I understand it's being sold. I understand there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of things going on. But we also have to understand we have a God, okay, who enforces his word. And if we learn to stand on his word, then we don't have to operate in fear. Now, does that mean we don't need to, you know, you know have food and things like that? I'm telling you, you know, you can... You can prepare as much as you want to prepare. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't do it out of fear. You know, do it because you feel led to do it in your spirit. So the enemy, you know, is going to try to come in like a flood. We know in the last days, guys, there's going to be all kinds of crazy things happening. You know, and you just need to stay at peace. Look at the people around you and tell them, stay at peace. You understand? Because um, I, I've seen people make some terrible mistakes in fear you know, and, uh, and buy into fear and then end up, you know, doing things that they normally wouldn't do because fear is a motivator. That's what it does. But make sure you, you do it, you know, when you, when you um, react to something, react according to the Word of God. Now, in Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So this is one of those verses of scripture, guys, where I've, I've watched preachers take it and preach it one way. And then I had somebody, um, you know, that was a pastor in my life one time. He took it and went a totally different direction with it. I didn't like it. I'm being honest. And, uh, you know, but, um, you know, but it, it's one of those things to where, I'm going to bring some ballots into it tonight. Can we do that? So, um, you know, when you look at the word condemnation, everybody say condemnation. Now, I have my own definition of condemnation. Condemnation is like, um, you know, I heard years ago the way you train a dog not to wet the floor is by rubbing their nose in it. Well, how many of you know a dog don't respond to that? It was a wrong philosophy, but a lot of times people pick that up in the church and they think the way God teaches is by kicking you when you're down. That the way God teaches is by rubbing your nose in your mistake. When we're told very clearly in Scripture that Jesus came to set us free from our mistakes. I mean, it's a simple truth as this. If we can, we can get over anything that, that we allow the Holy Spirit to help us get beyond. Give me an amen, y'all. There's a lot of things that I have, I have totally messed up on. Can we all be honest? But thank God I kept my heart right and God was able to recover it. And not only recover it, restore it, you know, and then and then actually wipe it out, <laughs> wipe it out, so I didn't have to deal with it any longer. But when we look at the word condemnation here, I want you to see this. When it says there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, how many of you are in Christ Jesus? Amen. How many of you know? Then you got you got the ability to walk free from condemnation. What this word condemnation means is an adverse sentence or a verdict. In other words, the same old, same old that everybody else lives by, Jesus came to set you free from that. Do you understand? Well, you know, so-and-so did it, and this is what they got. That doesn't mean you're going to get it. So, but if you look up, I mean, when you look this word up, Thayer's definition um, says, 
and, and I like this when he says it's a damnatory sentence. In other words, what he's saying is what would damn somebody else and what would create an atmosphere in somebody else's life that would bring damnation, the person who is in Christ Jesus has been set free from that law. Now, isn't that good, y'all? I mean, this, this, portion, this portion of Scripture, I'm telling you, I don't want to make light of it. I want to make heavy of it because there's so much in here. When we understand this, that means, guys, you know, if, if I make a mistake, Jesus didn't only pay the price for the sins that Adam committed and put us into. Do you follow me, Adam and Eve? But he also paid the price for anything that I would commit to. So that means even though I mess up, Christ has set me free from the, from the damnation of that thing, the damnatory sentence that comes from a mistake. Everybody say amen to that. So now that don't mean we should just go out and fumble our Christianity and fumble our life. Does everybody follow me? It means we're supposed to be engaged in walking this Christian life. We should do our best. But I mean, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I share stories, so here we go. Jesse Duplantis tells, you know, years ago I heard this, because I, I mean, I, I probably listened to Jesse more than I did anybody else when I was first coming up and um, cutting my spiritual teeth on something. And, um, you know, and he said he used to go out on the street and do a lot of street ministry, and he ministered to a, homo a lot of homosexuals on the street. And he said, I had two young preachers that wanted me to take them out, so he said, I took them out. And he said, um, and they were witnessing the people. He said, well, finally... One of the young preachers had witnessed this guy, and the, and, and the guy told him he wanted to pray a prayer. And Jesse tried to warn him they'll do anything they can just to get under your skin. You know, so he told him, he, he said, well, the guy led this, this guy in a prayer of salvation, and the guy prayed it. And the guy said, I'm saved, I'm saved. And he, and he hugged the preacher, and when he hugged the preacher, he stuck his tongue in the preacher's ear. So it was all just a, you know, just a ploy to get to, and the preacher got in the flesh. How many of you know there's about to be a damnatory sentence? It was going to be passed. Do you follow me? And, and this, is the way, this is the way the enemy knows, guys, how to, to get you. Well, here's one of the things. You can mishandle a situation like that. How many of you know it's easy to do? It would be easy to mishandle that situation. Come on, y'all. Seriously. But see, even mishandling that, God can bring restoration in that whole thing. You know, and this is what this is talking about. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But it also goes on to say this, who do not walk according to the flesh. Well, we're going to look at this in just a minute, but according to the Spirit. Now, if it says that we have the opportunity to walk according to the flesh and we have the opportunity to walk according to the Spirit, how many of you know it's a choice which one you walk in? It's simple, isn't it? We can choose to be fleshly, and sometimes it feels like that's a whole lot more fun, and in the natural it may be, or we can choose to be spiritual. Say it with me, y'all. It's all spiritual. <clears throat> all right, so what am I saying in this? You know, you make a decision every day how you're going to walk your life, how you're going to live your life. If you live to the flesh, you need to understand it's going to affect you. <coughs> If you live in the Spirit, you need to understand it's going to affect you. You got effects on both sides of the scale. And we're going to look at it. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So therefore, is it possible for you to walk free from sin? Very easy, isn't it? It's a choice. No more the devil made me do it. All right? No more of that. We, we can't use that excuse any longer. All right? Because Jesus has given us the right not to walk according to the flesh. Now, the flesh is a strong thing. Anybody agree with that? With strong desires. can really entice us. And move us into areas that we don't want to move into and, and, and sometimes do things. You know, and today, I, you know, I've been trying to do, um, my dog has got worse and worse and worse. And how many of you know, he's got to where he's begging so bad, I've been trying to break that out of him in a, in a good godly way. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 
So today I'm sitting down and I'm having a little bit of lunch, and he, he gets so into me eating to where he finally, he can't stand it. His mouth just follows the food. He's fleshly. Come on, y'all. Amen. Say it with me, y'all. He's fleshly. So I told him, I said, Oreo, I'm going to have leftovers. You need to get on the couch. And I t- you know, normally when I tell him to get on the couch, he gets on the couch. But today, he just was in a rebellious mode. And he went over, now this is the truth, guys, laid his head, put, walked up to the couch, bumped it with his chest, laid his head on the couch, and looked at me. <laughs> and I told him, get on the couch. And he would not get on that couch. I told him, no food if you don't get on the couch. Then he backed off the couch and sat in the floor and looked away from me. Now, y'all, how do dogs, they get it from Pam? No, they don't. I'm just joking, y'all. I'm just joking. How do dogs develop this? Do you realize this? It's a spirit of rebellion is what it is. They are totally natural creatures. Come on, y'all. This is, this is how it is. <clears throat> so... I, I finally, I finished eating. I had leftovers, and I told him, I said, you're not getting them until you get on the couch. Well, you know, I got up, and when I got up, he started walking toward the couch. I didn't kick him. I just tapped him in the butt, and he jumped on the couch, and I made him sit there for 15 minutes. All right, and then he was able to get the food. But whether it works or not, we'll find out tomorrow to be continued. Here's the thing, guys. Our flesh wants to do what our flesh wants to do, and it desires to have its own mind and will. All right, and when we walk in the Spirit, we shut that side of our lives down, and that's why our flesh rebels so much. Our flesh does not like to be controlled. All right, and it loves to get the mind to line up with it so that your spirit is weakened. But there's a law of sin. Everybody say sin. We don't hear this preached a lot in church. You need to understand there is a law of sin, and that, that can separate us from God if we let it go too far in our lives. But there's also a law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. Say amen to that, y'all. How many of you know there's a law of spirit of life that we can live in that sets us free from the law of sin and death? Now look at this and um, listen to it in the message translation. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Isn't that good, y'all? Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous Low-lying black cloud. A new power is an operation. Will you say that with me? A new power is an operation. Can we do it one more time? A new power is an operation. Well, what is that new power, guys? If there's a new power in operation, then I want that power operating in my life so that I don't give in to these little things anymore. You know, one of, I usually don't make New Year's resolutions because that way you don't have to worry about breaking them. All right, but this year I made, I made a New Year's resolution that I was going to try to handle traffic better. And so far I'm about 50-50 on it. But that's better than not trying at all. Do you follow me? You, you have to make these steps and things in your lives. You know, if I ask you the question right now, How many of you have things in your life that try to conquer you on a daily basis? I bet every hand would go up. You know, because we do. We deal with things on, whether it be a husband, whether it be a wife, whether it be kids, whether it be a job. I mean, it could be church. It could be people in church. I mean, it can be all kinds of stuff that can come against you. Well, we no longer live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. Listen to this. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently char- or cleared the air. Now listen to this, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. So in other words, God has freed us. Everybody say it with me, I am free. So remember this, condemnation means it is a verdict that has been passed. Okay, it's a damnatory sentence that wants to grab you. Listen, y'all, the world has no hope. How many of you, how many of you have realized this? They're saying right now, that um, there are countries, right now, where did I hear, was it South Korea? 
I think it is South Korea right now. They got one area that is completely shut down right now because they're trying to control this virus. All right, and they're, I mean, they're living in fear. Fear has got, got this thing. I heard they, if they hadn't done it already, they're in the process, if they hadn't already done it, canceling the Olympics because of fear. Everybody say fear. Now, this is, this is the thing, guys. We as a church have to be speaking up on this kind of stuff. Is that, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a thing here where we've got to be teaching healing. Come on, y'all. And walking in freedom. Walking out of some of this stuff. So, there's, when we talk about the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, I need you to understand something. A lot of people think law is power. And law is not power. All right, when, when you see a policeman standing out in the middle of an intersection with his light and his uniform on, how many of you know that he tells you to stop? He has the authority to tell you to stop. But you have the ability to ignore it. And him standing in the intersection cannot enforce and stand in front of your car and stop your car if he's got any sense. <clears throat> he has authority. But that does not mean that he has all power. Now, down the road, you're going to meet somebody if you run over this guy that's going to have all power. And they will put you in your place. So when we talk about law and when we start beginning to get into this, you understand that law is not force, but principles that govern force. So when the Bible talks about there's a law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, Jesus has made it possible for us to walk in victory. And that law is in place so that if you do what the Word of God says, then the power that comes with that will flow into your life. You know, and we can point this out with salvation. How many of you know being saved is a wonderful thing? <coughs> Amen. But you can also be healed. I mean, that's the same work that was done for us. So what happens, y'all? We don't enforce it in our lives. Or we hadn't figured out how to, how to bring it into our lives and to walk in the fullness of that. So laws are not force, but principles that govern force. Cops can be direct. Hey, speed limits. Everybody say speed limits. On 22, how many of you know the speed limit is 65 miles an hour? But it's up to me whether I do that or not. So it's a law that you drive the speed limit. I'm just trying to show you how this works. But it's your choice whether you drive it or not. Come on, y'all. It's up to you. You know, I heard one guy say, well, you know, I thought that was a suggestion. Well, they'll tell you real quick. It's not. All right? Now, I usually go five mile an hour over and never have had any problem but I can't tell you how many times, <coughs> excuse me, Pam and I have been driving, and I'll, I'll set my cruise at five mile an hour over, and somebody will come me doing 30 mile an hour over, and I'll look at Pam and go, they better hope a cop's not up there, and before long we'll see blue lights flashing. Now, how many of you know they made a choice, didn't operate according to the law, y'all with me, and it's going to pay the price for it. All right, so there's, there's laws in place, and you've got to understand this, and this is what governs the power of God. Let me look at it a different way, because I read this one day, and I found it real interesting. How many of you know there's a law of gravity in place? If you don't believe it, stand up and do some rapture practice right now. Jump as high as you can. <coughs> and what you'll find out is you'll come back down to the floor. But a bird uses a different law to take flight. Now, gravity is still in place, but a bird is built to fly. Y'all with me? But how many of you know, so will a balloon. But it's built totally different than a bird. A bird can fly because it knows how to get beyond gravity and use air to lift itself. But a balloon has to have something in it to help it lift itself. It's called helium. 
If you put helium in a balloon, it'll float and, and it's lighter than gravity. That's laws are here for a purpose. So we need to walk this thing out and understand that when God says that we can have different things in our lives, we just need to get ready to let the... Look here, guys. Your faith can change everything about your life. And if you'll begin to believe that Jesus, what Jesus said is true, and that God's word is true, then you won't be limited to the natural. You only become limited to the supernatural. Now, how many of you the super, know the supernatural don't have too many limitations on it? This is why it's so important. You know, I heard a story years ago about a guy who he played for Benny Hinn, played a cello, I think it was. And he said, um, you know, he said that the, he's praying about it. And the Lord told him, said, um, you, you're going to get this cello. And I, I think this thing back then was a hundred or $200,000 cello or something. I mean, it was really expensive. You know, and, and the guy said, well, I don't have the money to pay for that. The Lord said, I've spoken to someone to buy it for you. Now, how many of you know that's a good word to get? But it's also a challenging word to get. Because the guy that was supposed to pay for it was in New York. So he had to call the guy, and he told his businessman, he said, uh, the Lord told me you're going to buy me a cello. And the guy just really gave him a hard time. Well, finally, he, he said, I'm going to fly you up here and hear you play. And he said, well, I need, a, I need a ticket for me and a ticket for the cello. I can't put it under there because it's a $100,000 or $200,000 cello. And so the guy ended up buying him two tickets so he could find <laughs> He could fly up there, and when he got there, he started playing. Long story short, he started playing the cello or whatever, you know, the instrument, and the guy screamed and told him to stop. It was the worst thing. He, he said, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And he said, the guy was, he said, I was, I was sitting there, he said, because I knew God had given me the word. Everybody say the word. But, man, how many of you know stepping that word out <coughs> challenges you? So he said he's, he's sitting there, and, and this guy is hating everything about it, and finally he said the Holy Spirit whispered to him and told him, said, begin to pluck it. Instead of playing it, he started doom, 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 just plucking it. And the man started dancing around. Ended up buying him the cello. And he ended up getting everything that God said. Well, guys, your faith can override the natural. Come on, y'all, say amen. I, I share this with you because <coughs> you need to be aware there are laws that govern specific things, but when you get in Christ, just because natural law is in place does not mean that natural law can limit you beyond what it can limit other people. You have the Spirit of God. You have the power of God. You have something in you called faith that you can release and see those things change. And, and it can create all kinds of things in your life. So... Let's go a little bit further with this. In Psalm 40, in verse 5, it says, Many, O Lord, my God, are your wondrous works which you have done. How many of you know God has, how many of you God has done some awesome things in your life? <clears throat> Come on, y'all. How many of you God has done some awesome things in your life? How about this, y'all? He ain't done. How many of you know part of his, part of his natural response is awesomeness? Do you realize that? Just because he'd done something, well, I remember when. Well, quit remembering when, and let's get back to getting it some now. Every day of your life, many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wondrous works which you have done. Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. How about that, y'all? You've done so many good things, God. Has, you know, that's why sometimes the only thing I can go to him is say, thank you. Thank you. You know, Pam, Pam was telling me one time, I said, I said, hey, babe, do you love me? She said, yes, I do. I said, count the ways and do it now. And one time she started counting them, and I got embarrassed. I went, that's enough. That's enough. Now, that's the way it would be with God, y'all, if we started counting the ways. God, the ways that you've done, they're too, num they're too numerous for me to even bring an account of. Do you realize this, guys? God's been so good to us. How could we ever recall everything to memory? That's why I just tell him, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I want you to know I appreciate it. You know all that stuff you've done? Thank you for it. For every bit of it. For all of it. I can't recount them in order. If I would declare and speak them, they are more than can be numbered. Isn't that good? <laughs> 
I mean, if we begin to do this, so let me, let me take you to another verse of Scripture, Psalm 138, if you don't mind. Let's turn over there. Psalm 138. We're going to start off in verse 1. There's a law in place, guys, and this is the thing. Whenever we start operating according to the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, we have an opportunity to step out of the natural into the supernatural and see supernatural stuff just work over and over again. I, I've, I've, um, I've seen the law of the natural take place in my life, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, there, there was one time I went into a, a city council meeting, not here, it was in West Virginia, and I was trying to get sewage, um, you know, city sewage down to our property. And, you know, they, they were considering it and everything. When there was a man in town, I don't want to say his name. Well, well it would be all right. We're not going to be on YouTube. name was Jack Hill. And Jack Hill, he and I developed a relationship, you know, and, and uh, I, I, you know, he was, he was one of the richer guys in town and, he, he finally told me, he said, I heard you're going to the board meeting. It's a city council meeting. And he said, I have property that's just 500 foot further down the road. He said, tell them I'll pay to bring it all the way down to my property, and you can just attach to it. And how many of you know that's favor? You can just attach to it because it's going to save us a bunch of money, you know, if we could get it done, you know, because they're going to have to put a grinding station in. You know, there's a lot of things that came into play, you know, and I'm believing God for favor. Everybody say favor. So I went into this city council meeting, and, you know, and I presented everything and let them know. And they were talking about the money and talking about the finances, and I thought I had an ace up my sleeve. So I looked at them, and I said, well, you know, there's a guy down the road, and, uh, you know, he said that um, he would pay to bring it by the property and bring it all the way to his property. And, uh, you know, and if y'all want to do it, he's willing to, he's willing to foot some of the bill, you know, and take care of his part of it. You know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And they asked me, they said, what's this guy's name? And I didn't need, you know, sometimes you need to add. But I, I just didn't think about it. I mean, I just really, I didn't put two and two together to equal five or anything. Four, I know it's four. And um, so I mentioned his name. I said, Jack Hill. They slammed their book shut, closed the meeting, and told me to leave and not come back. And Pam, did I ever get anything else out of those people? Not a meeting, nothing. I could call, and they would not return my call, all because I mentioned one name. One name. And I'm thinking, man, oh, man, this is not good. <laughs> you know, because we need favor, and here I have just closed the door to favor. You know, and, uh, and I mean, they wouldn't give me the time of day, guys. They would, I mean, they, they would not even talk to me about anything after that. Ended up not getting sewage. We had to put a septic tank in. And I learned something very important, not to name drop when you go into a meeting. Okay, you don't name drop when you go into a meeting. Sometimes it might be beneficial. Sometimes it may not always be led by the Spirit of God. Can I get it? Now, God was able to compensate for it and overcome it, but it never worked out for us to get that, that one particular thing done. So when we start operating according to the laws of God, you need to understand that there is an enemy in place that would love to see nothing more for, than for you to be defeated. And he loves to use people to do it. So you've got to stay on your guard. Will you say amen? Let's go into this. Psalm 138, starting in verse 1. I will praise you with my whole heart. How much of your heart are you supposed to praise God with? How much? How much? Come on, y'all, how much of it? How much is whole? That's all of it, isn't it? That means we sell completely out. I mean, this is one of the things we need to do. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. In other words, don't you be manipulated to stop serving the one true awesome God just because other gods are in place. Come on, y'all, and think that they're in place. And this is a territorial thing. How many of you know we're supposed to worship God no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on, you want me to point it out to you? Paul and Silas were locked in the prison. And the Bible says at midnight they begin to sing and worship God. All right, so there you go, baby. There's one for you. Yeah. Yeah, his presence is a weapon. And shook them loose. 
I mean, even the guards started screaming at him to shut up. I don't know, maybe they couldn't carry a tune. Maybe the prison didn't have good acoustics or had two good acoustics. Who knows? But here it is. They just lifted their voice and began to worship. And you know, the Bible says while they worshiped, what happened? Chains just fell off. The doors opened up. But they still honored everything they were supposed to honor and did this thing right. So don't worry about, you know, who's looking at you. You need to, you need to do this and keep your eyes in the right place. Listen to what it says in verse 2. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Now, this is important for you to understand, guys. There are times, listen to me, there are times when you're dealing with evil influences that the name of Jesus needs to be the thing that you use to overcome that. You understand, when I cast out devils, I don't cast out devils in the name of Rick. You cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Come on, y'all. Amen. But there's times, guys, where you got to stand on the word. And I've watched people get this wrong. They'll just chant Jesus, Jesus, Jesus over, and it's not going to accomplish something when you need to be standing on the word. Now, when you pray and you use authority, you use it in Jesus' name. I know this is going to shake some things up, so just listen to me a minute. But there are times when you just need to know the word of God, and then you stand on that word. And that means I don't manipulate anything from there. I just declare that word. I declare that that word's going to work. And I stand on that word and I stand there. And when it works, I just keep standing on it. I believe this. You know, there's some things when we get to the end of this verse of Scripture, this is one of the verses of Scripture I've been using over the last two, two and a half years that God laid on my heart. So, you know, um, I'm standing on that. You know, I declare some things. I declare the word of God. But to know the Word of God and walk according to the Word of God brings you a freedom and a liberty that you may not have just praying something out of fear. All right, so know the Word and get the peace of God in your life because if you know the Word and you know the Word works, everybody say it works, then you can stand on that Word, and if you stand on that Word, you don't have to sweat it from that point on. It's not your responsibility. You just stand on the Word and let God work it out. And I've had to do this before. I went to God and said, hey, you know, I've been standing on this word for a while now, God. You know, and, and he said, yeah, and I'm still working it out. Because he's having to work through other people. He's having to speak to people's hearts. And how disobedient can you be sometimes? <clears throat> Is my money and I want it? No, I don't. You've magnified your word above all your name. And the day when I cry out, you answer me. Cried out, you answered me. And made me bold with strength in my soul. Here it is, guys. You have to understand that you've got to get beyond this thing of, well, you know, I, I just wonder if God can. I wonder if God's able. Can I tell you something, y'all? The Bible declares that God is able. Say it with me, y'all. God is able. Can we do it again? God is able, and if you make that declaration and you stand on that, man, does that put some new wind in your sails? You know, I mean, it, it just lifts you up a little bit when you begin to understand that. It says, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words for, of your mouth. Here's the thing, guys. One day, it's all going to change. One day, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, they sing the ways of they they shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Look at the people around you and say it's time for you to be revived. Come on, y'all. We walk in the midst of trouble sometimes. It's the truth. We walk in the midst of trouble sometimes. But it's time for you to be revived. There has to be a time when you just, when God shows up. Do you understand? And some, everything changes. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And at your hand, your right hand will save me. Now here it is, verse 8. Psalm 138, verse 8. How many of you remember this verse of scripture? This is one that I, I quoted almost daily. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. 
Everybody say it with me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Remember I preached this and I said concerneth. The Lord will perfect that that concerneth me. In other words, whatever concerns me, God's going to work it out for my good. The Lord's going to perfect, perfect that. You need to understand that. He's going to perfect it in such a way to where you're going to walk in victory. You know, and, and I have to remind myself of this sometimes because of, of um, my family. Not, fa not family family. But, um, but my family, you know, and every time the enemy comes in, and tries to get to my mind about my kids, I don't let him do it. Do you understand? Now, do, it, do, it, do I have right to be concerned sometimes? Yes. But I choose not to. Come on, y'all, because the Bible says I have to cast all my care on the Lord. But it don't just say cast, it said because he cares for me. Do you understand? So I got to cast my care on the Lord. I mean, this is one of those things, you know, I just have to, I just have to look at situations sometimes and say, you know what, God, you're big enough to handle it. I just got to say, have at it. Just have at it. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Will you say amen to that? The Lord perfects all that concerns. So when we look at this and we see it, we, we go back and we go, God, you know, I, I behold everything that you've done. I see all that you've done. And therefore, that makes it so, guys, I'm not left out here just serving without any purpose. I'm not serving without someone who responds to me. Do you understand? When I worship, my worship is not in vain. Because I know God receives my worship. Well, I don't feel like he does. Well, quit worshiping according to your feelings. Worship according to your faith. Do you follow me? God says he'll hear you. Well, I just don't feel like he does, so shut up and do it anyway. Come on, y'all, just do it, because God says he'll hear you. How can you worship and God not hear you? God, I'm tired today, Rick. I'm just too tired to listen, Rick. Yeah, you know, I've been dealing with Miss Barbara all day long. <laughs> what if God responded to us like we respond to people? Now, I don't want to, I, I, I just, right, right now I don't want to minister to nobody else, Rick, all right? Give me a break and let me have a cup of coffee. That's not the way God is, guys. Come on, y'all think about it. And this is the way we think sometimes. I mean, I actually, I asked somebody here, and it's been a while back, I asked them, I said, they were telling me about some things going on. It happened here, so, you know, if, if you're here, I'm sorry. But anyway, I, I told them, I said, well, did you pray about it? Well, I just don't think I'll bother God. You got, really and truly, you think you can bother God? How many, uh, I, mean, I mean, this is crazy. Now, how many of you watch Bruce Almighty? You ever see Bruce Almighty? And some people don't watch it because they... They're, they think it's sacrilegious. But I think it points some good things out, you know, where, you know, why God don't, you know, you know, when, when Bruce, he starts hearing all the prayer, prayers of everybody, and he tries to figure out how to work it out, and he says, sticky notes. Let's put them all on sticky notes. And all of a sudden, you hear this sound, and it, brrr, sticky notes are everywhere, on him and everywhere. You know, and more coming in. Well, then, you know, he does filing cabinets, and you can't even move. Filing cabinet. So, well, finally, he puts them on a computer, and it starts, and I forget how many millions and millions of prayer requests he gets, so he answers them all, yes. Boy, that worked out good for him. Well, this is the thing, guys. God's got time for you. Man, he don't, he's not like man. He don't tire. And he cares. And that's the only reason why I shared that. You need to understand. Don't be afraid to go to God. You're not going to jerk him off his throne with your problem. You're not going to be so big and burdensome to cause him to crash and burn. Can I say it this way? God can handle you. Let him. Amen. Take it to him. Let him. Good. <laughs> 
Go to Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at this just a little bit different. We're talking about steadying your stance, and I titled tonight, I'm in a relationship with salvation. And the reason why I did that is because sometimes we get, we get busy doing everything other than what God told us to do. It's just so, re it's so time, y'all, for the church to get back in charge and get God right in the right place that he's supposed to be. Because, uh, you know what, I can figure a lot of things out on my own. How many of you know, man, you give me, you give me an opportunity, I can figure something out. Crazy glue and duct tape, you can fix a lot. Do you understand? You can fix a lot. We can figure out how to put something back together. But that doesn't mean it's back together right. And I've seen God do some awesome things in people's lives. I mean, I, I could share stories with you in relationships where God has totally, I mean, healed relationships that should have never been put back together. In the natural, it looked impossible. There, I mean, I was in one counseling, this has been years and years ago, in one counseling session, uh, should I do that one or not, where... Um, yeah, I won't, I won't go into details, but anyway, it was just, you know, the marriage was breaking down, and I met with them, and I started talking to them, and then some things were exposed, and I asked them the question, I said, you know, guys, let me tell you something, I said, God wants you to be healed, come on, how many of you know this, God wants relationships restored, it's not a question of if he does, we know he does. The question is, and this is what I asked them, do you want it restored? And I looked at each one of them, and I said, I looked at her first. I said, do you want this thing fixed? Do you still love this man? Come on, y'all, that's an important question, isn't it? Because that, that's a foundational thing. And she looked at me, and she had every right to say no. Do y'all follow me? But she said, I love him, yes, I want it to work. Now I looked at him and asked him the same question. Do you want this to work? Do you want this, this lady in your life? Yes, I do. I watched God put that thing back together stronger than it had ever been before. All right, because God knows how to fix you if you'll let him do it. <clears throat> Listen to what it says in Galatians 5. We're going to start off in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. What does it say we need to do, y'all? What's the first two words? <coughs> what does it mean to stand fast? Stand your ground. Stand, stay in place. A lot of people miss healing because they try to run and find it. You need to stay where you're supposed to be planted. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times, and, I, and I, I've done this recently, where, you know, people tell me, well, I'm going to run so I can find healing. You're not going to find healing if you run. Right? Like you're not going to find peace if you run. All right, you got to get peace where you are. If not, evil is a magnet. Do you understand? And wherever you go, you're going to magnetize that area and bring the same thing that you were dealing with right back to you again because you didn't get fixed. You didn't get healed. It doesn't matter where you go. Evil exists anywhere you go. So you're not going to be able to run and get freedom. You've got to get freedom here. Then when you get free, if you want to go, you can go. And now the Spirit of God can magnetize you to bring what God needs into your life. Kind of weird, but it's true. So you can't run and get it. You need to get it here. Get it right. And it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Well, what does it mean by that, guys? Here it is. God gives us freedom. Everybody say freedom. I got liberty in my life. How about you? Okay, God gives it to you, but is it possible for you to lose that liberty? <coughs> well, according to Scripture, you can. Now, where does that happen at? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but I know this. You can begin to get tangled up again in some of that old stuff, and eventually it's going to take over your life again, and I've seen this play out time and time again in people's lives, and let me be honest, even in mine, because you've got to stand fast. Everybody say stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and choose not to be entangled again. You know, here's the thing. You know, it's one thing, guys, is if somebody grabs you. You know, I had a, I had a young man in, 
In church one time, he was, he was showing off his strength. But y'all let me be real, you're not going to get mad at me, right? He was showing off his strength, and I was in a meeting with someone, talking to somebody after church. And he come up to me, and I mean, this, this young man was strong. He was strong as an ox. You ever heard that? You know, he, I mean, he was. He was strong. And I had my hands down. I was talking, you know, and I had my hands, and I dropped my hands, and he come up behind me and just, just locked, knuckle-locked around me with my arms down. Well, you know, I was busy. How many of you know I wasn't always saved? So I do remember things. And I was busy, so I asked him, I said, how about let me go? And he said, if you're a man, break it. Well, you know, challenge accepted. So I, I made him let me go. I ain't going to tell how. But, and it was just like that. You men understand what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, it was just like that. I mean, never, I couldn't get my hands up, so I used what I had. And I remember I grabbed him, put him in the seat, and put my knee in his chest and said, is that good? And he went, yes, sir. Did you know he never did that to me again? But he understood. And it wasn't a mean thing. You know, it, he was challenging an old man, according to him. Let me say it this way. He was challenging a wiser man than he was, you know. And, you know, I ended up being able to minister to him, and every, everything ended up fine. Well, it's one thing, guys, if the enemy comes up and tries to grab a hold of you and lock you into something. How many of you know the power within you that Christ has placed inside of you gives you the ability to break free? Do you understand? But now it's totally different. Everybody say totally different when I offer my hands to be tied. And this is what this is talking about. Be careful. If the enemy tries to sneak up on you, remember we just read this verse of Scripture, if he comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against him and whip him. You got the power in you to walk free. Come on, y'all. Everybody say, I got, it. I got it. You need to understand this. You have the power in you to walk free. But if you issue your hands to be tied, then it's a different story because you have surrendered to the tying process. All right, that's a little bit different, so you need to understand that's going to be handled different. Listen to what it says, stand fast. This is why the Word tells us, stand fast in the liberty which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Listen to verse 2. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you, if you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Well, what they were struggling here was, was following the law. They were following, they were trying to work it out in such a way to where it would all just fit with everything else they were doing. How many of you know God don't fit in with everything else? Come on, y'all. Jesus broke the box. Do you understand? He broke the religion box. And this is what a lot of people, ooh, as I heard somebody say, if Jesus showed up today in most churches, they'd ask him to leave. Because they wouldn't be able to accept him how he is. Because he is not what most religions say he is. Listen to verse 4. He says, when you start doing it the world's way, when you start doing it just as an act of doing, you have become estranged from God. Everybody say estranged from, from Christ. Listen. Listen. This is what it is, guys. I, 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 can, I can become, so, you know, I've, I, I've had people tell me this before. You know, I just feel like I don't even know God anymore. How many of you know that, that that's the way people can get their lives? Uh, you know, I, we had a, when, before we moved away, um, I, had a fr I have a friend of mine, and he was in the Word of Faith Church and really believed in God, and, you know, I went, we went away for 10 years, and when I came back, I reconnected. How many of you know that's important? I reconnected with him. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, um, I believe different now than what I used to believe. And I said, really? I said, how's that? He said, well, I don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, I just think that whole thing's wrong. And I said, well, okay, you know, like that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to try to smack him around or anything. And he said, I, I don't believe that God heals everybody. I think God uses sickness to, to teach people lessons. And I said, where do you find that in Scripture? And he said, well, I, I don't find that in Scripture, but I've walked through some things. 
Well, y'all, if we let life experience define the word of God in our lives, life will talk you out of everything that God says you can have. Come on, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stir it up now, including your salvation. Including your salvation. Because life without limits and faith will cripple you. He says this, you become estranged from Christ, you who tempted to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Everybody, everybody say that with me, fallen from grace. That means grace wasn't taken away. That just means they stopped applying it. I mean, it's simple, isn't it? They just stopped applying it. It's, it's, just, it's really simple, you know? And, and this is what it says in verse 5. For though we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision, uh, uncircumcision availeth anything. In other words, works is not what gets you there. Does everybody follow me? Faith is what gets you there. Listen to what verse 7 says. You ran well. Everybody say it with me. You ran. <laughs> Listen to it. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So something happened to stop their running. What happened is they started walking. They lost their excitement. Come on, y'all. They let somebody come in and teach something totally different and, and th from the Word and took their excitement away in the Word of God. And now all of a sudden they're not running with the things of God. Now they just started getting a little wore out. You know, it's, it's kind of like um, I took a test one time, you know, and my goal whenever I take tests is to try to do the best that I can do. How many of you are with me? And I hate not doing my best. But I took this test one time to sell insurance, and, and when I took the test, I finished it, and the, the girl looked at me and she said, you passed. And I went, okay, what was my score? Come on, y'all, what was my grade? And she said, doesn't matter. You passed. And I said, does matter. What was my score? What was my grade? She said, we don't give out grades. We just give out passing or failing. Well, y'all want more than that. Do you understand? I, I just, in my life, as, as far as being a Christian, I don't want to make it in by the skin of my teeth. Does everybody follow me? I want to make it in going 100%. You know, what was the one preacher I heard? He said, when he gets to heaven, he wants to hear, um, well done, not medium rare. Think about that, guys. When I get to heaven, I want to hear, well done, not medium rare. Think about it, y'all. Run your race. God gave you the ability to overcome and do it in high fashion. You need to do it. Listen, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And it says, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And then he goes on with verse 9. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Well, you know, the simple truth of the matter is, if we'll learn to kill things when they're little in our lives, how many of you know it'll stop it from getting big? Because the bigger, the harder it is to deal with. If you can catch it immediately and let the Holy Spirit lead you in the right way, I mean, there, there's times in my life, guys, where, you know, uh, you know, I've had a wrong response. Anybody ever responded wrong to somebody? Don't look at me all holy, y'all. I know we do. You just respond wrong. But if you'll catch that thing immediately, how many of you know, and say, hey, man, I just missed it. How many of you know? You, I mean, it's a whole lot easier to clean up then than it is ten years later or five years later. So, you know, and the Bible calls that the little foxes that spoil the vine. In other words, these little things in our lives can cause the biggest problems sometimes. Listen to what it says in verse 10. I'm going to try to finish this tonight. <coughs> I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, 
if I still preach circumcision, why do, you, why do you still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So this is what happens eventually. If you're not careful, you end up closing the door on yourself. You know, have you ever slammed your own finger in the door? Isn't that just a good feeling? Now, I watched a video not too long, where, long ago where a guy slammed his hand in the car hood and it closed all the way. And, the, you know, you can't open them, but from the inside. So he's just stuck. I mean, you cannot, you, I mean, he could not. He was trying to pry the hood up and everything, but it had locked on him. Well, you know, that's a, the that's a thing. When you do something like that, how many of you know, it, so if you're not careful, you can actually slam the door on yourself. And this is something that, that Paul's trying to warn of here, and he's trying to, he's trying to tell it. Listen, verse 13, for, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Everybody say liberty. But it says, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you know, you won't, you won't break anything, guys, if you'll do this. If you'll put other people first and love your neighbor just like you love yourself. Now, somebody asked me a question, what if I hate me? Is it legal for me to hate other people? Well, the first thing is you shouldn't hate yourself. You know, you gotta you gotta be comfortable with who you are. That's a that's a trap of the enemy to, and totally different. It says, but in verse fifteen, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you can cons be consumed by one another. So, in other words, whatever a man sows, that's what they also reap. Well, there's another law for you. Verse sixteen. So I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Say amen to that. Now listen, y'all, I'm, I'm going to go through these kind of quick because i got a minute. Well, i got a little bit more. It says, for the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, everybody say that with me. Now, the works of the flesh, can we do it again? Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Now, and, you know, and I went through these and taught them, and, um, you know, because I think it's important for us to understand. I'm just going to mention them tonight. We're not going to do an in-depth teaching on them, on them, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbirth of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revel is that right? revelries, and the like of which I told you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you've heard me teach on this before, and let me do this. Understand this, guys, y'all. These things are works of the flesh. Come on, y'all. So allowing the flesh to control and dominate us, it will do anything that it needs to do to get fulfilled. But the problem with the flesh is it can never be satisfied. Think about it. My flesh, if I, guys, let me tell you. Can I tell you? I love them little white powdered donuts. Anybody know what I'm talking about? A little white powder donuts? Boy, give me a gallon of milk and a bag of them things. I can do them in one bite a piece. <sighs> milk. <sighs> milk. Now listen, y'all. I like them, but they don't like me. Everybody knows where I'm going here. So I had to make my mind up that I just don't do it. Come on, y'all. Will you say that with me? Just don't do it. <laughs> now, I'm telling about one of the things for me, okay? But I'm trying to tell you, now, can I do it? Absolutely. I make a choice not to do it. Come on, y'all. And this is the way the flesh is. These things are not things that you cannot control. And that's what I'm trying to point out to you. 
You can control yourself. I, I, told you, I told you a story about, you know, I've had friends that would, you know, uh, Christian friends didn't mind. We'd working at the beach. They'd look at women and, you know, especially, you know, when we were down close to the beach with the bikinis and all that kind of stuff and try to get me to look, and I just kept my eyes on my own salad. Because if you learn how to keep your eyes in the right place, then you won't have the temptation that other people have. I'm telling you right now, guys, you've got to learn how to walk this thing out right. And these things that it mentions in here about these being the works of the flesh, everybody say flesh, means that you can control them. Because you can dominate your flesh. But then it talks about if you practice these things, you've got to understand sometimes what ends up happening is some of this stuff will take us away from God. And it'll stop heaven from flowing into us. Anyway, say amen. You need to read those, you know, and, and go through them. I, I challenge you, if you'll do this, guys, and do it with the right, understand these things are works of the flesh. If you control the flesh, then you control these things. Amen, anyhow. All right, listen to what it says in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say love. Listen to this. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Everybody say self-control. How many of you know self-control? If you turn around, it means controlling yourself. And I'm telling you right now, we need more of it preached in church. Control thyself. We're praying for God to do it all and get some guts about you and control yourself. Take those channels off the TV. It create problems for you. Amen. You know, put some checks and balances in your life. Oh, I'm getting in trouble now. I better go on. Self-control and handle it. Against such there is no law. Verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. Everybody say amen. <laughs> Listen to this, y'all. We crucify the... What does it mean to crucify the flesh? You got to put it under. I mean, come on, y'all. You got to nail it to that cross. I mean, you literally do. You know, if you want to control it. Now, this means, you know, did you know, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I know I've shared this with you, but I have to control my anger. I, I tend to be an angry person. Now, y'all wouldn't know that since I'm such an angel up here in front of church. But I, my wife can tell you, she can tell exactly when I start letting little things get under my skin because little things cause big reactions. And if little things, if I don't control this, then I'll start, I'll fly off the handle. Oh, come on. I will. So I have this book of promises. I go through and I read scriptures on anger. Do it several times a year. You know, I got it on my iPad now, so I do it several times a year. And every time I start applying scriptures in my life, my anger level comes down. But if I don't practice self-control, my anger level goes up. Come on, y'all. We got one honest one in here right now. Well, two with me. You understand what I'm saying? But, but the way you handle it, here you go, guys, is by operating in some self-control. And use scripture to bring that into place. Shackle that old man up. Or old, not your husband's. Shackle that old lady up, not your wives. Bring it, you got to nail some of this stuff and get it fixed in your life, guys, because I'm telling you right now, it'll take you places that you can't figure out how to get out of without the help of God. Thank God he helps us. Will you say amen to that? I'm going to read 24 again, and then I'm going to close it out here in 25 and 26. Says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, everybody say, I live in the Spirit. Let us also walk in the Spirit. Say it with me. I can and I will walk in the Spirit. So here's the thing, guys. Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. But it's our job to walk in that freedom. To walk in the law of the Spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Come on, y'all. But it's my job to walk in it. All right, it's my responsibility to enforce it. I'm the enforcer in my life. And I, if I enforce it in myself, 
that I'll operate in victory, I'd much rather do it to me than I would to have you do it to me. Does everybody follow me? I, I mean, if I can gain the control and gain the, the ability to control it on my own, I don't have to worry about the prophets coming in and read my mail to everybody. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. But anyway. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And verse 26 says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. How many of you know it's important that we stable our stance? Stabilizing your stance means that you get yourself under control so that when those things come against you, you got firm ground to stand on. A person who knows who they are in Christ can stand against anything that comes against them. Come on, y'all, because we'll close it out this way. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. We do play 